So um, today we've got Patrick Shaw Stewart and he's going to talk about the evolution of respiratory viruses, hypotheses and practical considerations. So over to you, Patrick. My name's Patrick Shaw Stewart. Uh, sorry, I was kind of thinking Dominic was going to <laughs> uh, cover this. That's fine. Um, so I run a very small company that makes uh, equipment for um, protein crystallization. And so I, I, you know, I sort of just take an interest in the science that basically our customers do. I did a zoology degree. I studied molecular biology at Henry University for a year after that. And I've done various sort of bio, I worked in bioengineering, a bioengineering department for a while. Um, I became interested in um, respiratory viruses um, when, well, it's in my talk, I'll show you in a second, but basically I was in India and I was with a um, our distributor and at the end of a long trip we were both sort of exhausted and she said oh dear and we were just sort of at, at an airport about to go home and she said I'm going down with a cold as well and I said oh I didn't realize people got colds in India because it's hot here she said oh yes we do and I said oh well I bet you were chilled at some point and she said oh Patrick everyone knows that chilling doesn't make you ill uh, it won't bring on a cold so I, um, I said, I had a bet with her. I said, I bet you I can find biochemical evidence that uh, influenza, because that's the most well-studied virus, responds to temperature and becomes more active at lower temperatures. And so that was how I got interested in this. So I'll just uh, go right into the talk and share my screen. So that here. Um, Okay, and um, so so um, so I was I, I, I was going to start by just telling you what got me interested in this. I wanted to talk a little bit about viral hemorrhagic fevers because these are really extraordinary illnesses that people aren't very aware of. They're obviously not common, but they they crop up quite regularly. Then I was going to summarize the hypothesis, and I don't know how many of you have had time to look at the video which I sent, but I, I, will, I will summarize it. There's a lot more evidence that I won't have time to go into. And if you watch the video or look at our papers, you'll, you'll, um, you can find out a lot more. Um, I'd like to just quickly talk about what we want. Basically, we'd like to run experiments. And we're trying to convince people to, to run experiments that would, as I say, shed light on pathogenicity and seasonality. Um, that, then I wanted to go and go back a bit and talk about what people call the trade-off model, because I think this is absolutely fundamental to understanding viruses. I don't think you can really understand what's going on if you're not aware of this. And a lot of scientists sort of treat uh, respiratory viruses as though they're sort of constant, and never change. But actually, I think it's, it's very clear that they are, they respond reasonably quickly, like in months, weeks or months, to selective pressures. And I'm going to give one example at the end of how there might be rather unexpected selective pressures, depending on how we deal with things. And so you're asking whether this is about um, coronavirus. I mean, it absolutely is, because coronavirus is just like all these other viruses. And this is part of our point. It's extraordinary that all these different viruses basically have the same seasonality in particular. And the, the implication is that they've that they're using a common mechanism. So, uh, can you, is this sort of blocked? Can you see, uh, is that better? I, 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 I'm not quite sure what you can see. We can uh, see your screen. The writing yeah. was covered by something on my screen. Uh, no, so, okay, so I came across, it's, I, I've, I've cleared it up, so that's fine. Um, I came across this quote on Twitter quite recently and saying this is by a, a, an American um, author and she says, the hardest thing to explain is the gra glaringly evident which everyone has decided or had decided not to see. And I particularly like this because I find it actually hard to explain um, what were the, the, the hypothesis. Um, 
it's like people just don't scientists just don't hear it when when we try and explain it they they, they just it's almost like they don't want to totally hear it. And then I wanted to very quickly just uh, mention a bit of jargon, because I'll forget to mention it later on, this word tropism. So we call our hypothesis temperature-dependent viral tropism, and tropism just means the tendency of a virus to, it almost is a virus in this sense of the word, the tendency of a virus to infect a certain tissue or host. So you might say, the host tropism of myxomatosis is rabbits. Um, so we, we talk about that a bit. So going back to, or starting with what got me interested in respiratory viruses, well, it began when I was at St. Andrews and I was an undergraduate, and I was told that if you got chilled, it would not bring on a cold. And I just found this extraordinary because it was just obvious to me that I, sometimes get a cold when I'm chilled and my friends do and it was as I remember saying to a friend it's almost like saying you know um, aspirin won't cure a headache or something and now I would say um, that's very interesting show me the experiments because we might be able to learn something from this um, because uh, it's obvious that chilling can bring on a cold but maybe we maybe there's something funny about your experiments and and maybe this could be important um so i was always always interested in respiratory viruses after that and i was really looking for an explanation um then as i say when i went to india i think it was the first or second time um i discovered that people in the tropics do get colds and this is from a, a paper this is influenza and you can see can you see my mouse? I should have made it bigger, really, but uh, anyway. Yes, we can. Uh, thank you. So obviously the seasonality in viruses come uh, uh, in the winter. In the tropics, they tend to be, you can see single, they tend to be there all the time at intermediate levels. So there's very often more respiratory illness in the tropics all through the year than there is in temperate areas in the summer. Um, and then in some places it's, it's wind and rain. So in Fortaleza here, it's the rainy season. I, did I put the slide in? No, I didn't. Uh, but anyway, that basically corresponds to the rainy season. And then the third thing that I was interested in was uh, viral hemorrhagic fevers. Now, um, they're odd. So obviously viruses can jump from one species to another. And there's, when this happens, it's quite common that you basically get, you start to hemorrhage, you get hemorrhagic fevers. And there are many, many of these caused by different viruses, um, normally named after the place that they come from. Sometimes, uh, some of them like Marburg, Lassa, and Ebola, these are obviously things that can spread from person to person. And then there are other viruses that I put down here, which are not, um, they don't cause hemorrhage, but there are also nasty viruses and they've, they've uh, jumped over from a, another species. They tend to come from, they can come from many different animals. The majority come from uh, rodents. And then a certain number, Marburg, Ebola, and then other things like rabies and SARS come from bats. Um, but that's just that's just I just find that interesting um thing that's so strange is that they're obviously not well adapted to humans and yet they sometimes can absolutely overwhelm your defenses so uh they, they sometimes you just get uh, um, an infection you don't even know you've had it but you can see that someone has been infected because they have antibodies other times people get flu-like symptoms, which then go away. But if, it, if these things take hold, they're very often fatal and, and you get hemorrhaging. So um, the question is why don't rhinovirus, the denovirus, common cold viruses and all the other things, why don't they cause hemorrhaging? Why does it go in one person all the way from just infecting to, to killing you? And uh, presumably there's sort of rapid evolution within, within one person. And the, the, I think the only explanation, the only possible explanation is that it's actually not that hard. 
for a virus to overcome our immune defences. Most viruses aren't really trying, and we'll come to why that might be, but um, if, it's, if it's so reasonably common that, that a virus can just completely over, overwhelm your defences um, when they're not well adapted, the implication is that well adapted viruses don't, don't the selection does not encourage them to kill you as quickly as possible. And this is the so-called trade-off model. Now, um, I'll come back to this in a bit more detail, but we have the idea that viruses are moderating their pathogenicity. In the case of respiratory viruses, the virus would like to infect just the parts of the body that they can spread from. They want to infect the nose and throat. They don't want to infect your lungs or you know, your, your brain or your heart because this will immobilize you. And I'll come back to that point. And the key here seems to be temperature. So um, if you have a moment, have a look at the movie on YouTube. Um, I'm going to get my friend Brian to explain uh, the, the hypothesis because he's a non-scientist and he, uh, he's, good at, good at, uh, he's a good communicator. So he said, in order to replicate a virus that moves from host to host, this requires a transmission method sneezing, etc., which will fail if the host dies or is too ill to socialize. Moderate symptoms and a long incubation period are thus ideal. The virus accomplishes this by being sensitive to temperature. The colder temperatures are in the mouth and nose, which is where transmission through sneezing will happen. To replicate at higher temperatures, such as the lungs, would incapacitate the host and so prevent transmission. However, the problem with COVID-19 is that it seems not to be sensitive or as sensitive to temperature. So it's getting into more lungs. The seasonal pattern of respiratory viruses is, is, is a consequence of this. As temperatures rise in the air and thus in the mouth and nose, the virus tends not to replicate in any part of the body. That would be in spring. Is that it? And I said, to which I replied, that is, um, Brian, you have absolutely got the idea. Um, now I'm going to just show you a few slides uh, from the, the, the uh, video and from our paper without going into too much detail. This is, this is um, respiratory illness in children in a hospital in Mainz in Germany. And just a couple of points to make. One is you can see that all these different viruses arrive at rather irregular times, but usually the peak of illness is in early February, around that time. And usually the trough is in August. So when you add them all together, it's a relatively smooth curve. The other thing to say is that people will tell you that um, certain viruses arrive at certain, certain respiratory viruses arrive at certain times of year. Like people say that rhinovirus, which is green here, comes early in the season and in midwinter. Now, that is often true, but in other places, look in 2004 here, it was very prevalent late in the season and the same thing in 2007. So I would say you really can't generalize like that. And in some places you get a re repeating pattern, but in some other, you go to somewhere else in the world and it's completely different. So I think all, I believe all you can really say is that low temperature in, increases the amount of respiratory illness. Um, now this is another, slide that I, I one of my favorite uh, graphs, but this is from a study that was done in um, the Netherlands in 1925-1926. And um, the, the dotted lines here are colds and flu in all these different places in uh, the Netherlands. I've added colored lines. These are temperatures in five weather stations in Holland at that time. And hi, hi. Um, so um, obviously, you can see that there's this extraordinary correlation. I, ex I'm sorry, I didn't know that I wasn't muted. <laughs> Excuse me. I'm sorry, I can't, I can't see you because I've I've turned it to um, I've okay. shrunk it down, so I can only see one person at a time. Okay, everyone, please remember to mute your mic. Thank you. You can unmute in a second. Thank you very much. Um, so, so there's this extraordinary correlation. The other thing that's obvious is that there's an extraordinary synchronization. All parts of um, the Netherlands are all responding within 
one or two weeks at times. They're, they're absolutely synchronized. And the other thing is that it works well as temperatures falling. When temperatures start rising, the correlations are much less clear. Now, this uh, graph is a bit confusing, and I won't try and explain the whole thing, but we're looking at four different uh, subspecies, or what do they call them? Four different types of strains, really, of influenza, and subclasses, I think they call them. Um, so you've got two of influenza B, and then you've got A, H1N1, and A, H3N2. And um, this was published in a paper in 2015. And they've divided the world into nine regions, and you can see each region is color-coded. And it's showing you where the ancestors of the viruses that were present in those regions were going back in time. And what's very interesting is that you can see that Influenza tends to go from hot places to cold places. And this is predicted by our hypothesis because um, in order to replicate at all, a virus, a respiratory virus has to lose temperature sensitivity in the tropics because it's hotter there and it just wouldn't replicate. But if you took a strain from the tropics and took it to a temperate area, it would be intrinsically very, very virulent and it would cause more illness, so it would tend to spread more. So the implication is that viruses tend to go from hot places to cold places. And you can see this. If you compare North and South China here, these arrows show that in three out of four cases, influenza moved from, um, from South China to North China more often than it did in the other directions. And there's one case here, the Victoria type strains went more often from North China to South China. And if you look at Europe, it's a high percentage, up to 62% in the case of H1N1, came from hot places one year earlier than they did the study. Uh, this is another very interesting um, study. This was done by a group called the Euro Winter Group. And again, this is one of these things that's really been ignored. I, I feel it's very interesting. Uh, they used market research techniques to investigate the effect of what they called cold exposure factors, things like whether you go outside, whether you dress warmly, where, um, temperature of your bedroom, things like that. And I've plotted the um, regression coefficients here against their significance. So things on the right are very, very low significance. So go, it doesn't matter whether you go outdoors or not with regard to respiratory illness. Things on the left, highly significant. Now, these are correlations, so we can't say that, as we all know, correlation doesn't, doesn't necessarily imply causation. But if you shiver outside, this is correlated with an increased chance of dying of a respiratory illness. If you stand still outside for more than two minutes, this is also correlated with dying of a respiratory illness. Sweating outside is protective, which is interesting, um, which we might come back to if we have time. And wearing clothing, like wearing a parka, is protective. Wearing a skirt is, is correlated with increased risk. So, it, again, this is evidence that chilling at the personal level can, can um, influence respiratory illness. So, is COVID-19 seasonal? Well, I think it's very clear that it is. And you have to look at a big scale because there's a, so much noise in the signal. And, um, you know, because we're stopping and starting lockdowns, there's vaccines coming in and so on. But it's very clear that if you look in August 2020, there was a dip in Europe and to some extent in North America, whereas there was a peak in uh, South America and then it switched over in our winter. And then uh, this summer, again, it's uh, Europe and Northern Hemisphere has dipped down and Southern Hemisphere has gone up. Um, now, there's a whole lot of biochemistry on this, and we cited, I think, something like 20 papers in our, in our, uh, uh, our review, so Julia Bach and I, and um, this, is the begin this is the first part of our Table 5. A lot of it is things like how um, viral transcription, viral translation, how they are affected by temperature. Um, but you can read that in the paper. Now, what experiments would we like to do? Well, um, basically, 
we like to do things. Uh, most of these are based around temperature shift experiments. So what happens if you raise or lower temperature? And the important thing is you have to use fresh virus because what we think happens is what most labs do is they'll take a, they'll isolate a virus, which means propagate it, make it multiply in the lab, and then they'll use that as their standard strain so things are reproducible. The problem is they almost always do that at 37 degrees. And the first thing that happens, we think, is that the virus loses its temperature sensitivity. And a lot of experiments have been done with viruses that have been in labs for you know, decades at, and um, passaged, as they call it, multiple times at 37 degrees. So we'd like to firstly just find the temperatures that viruses can be isolated most easily at, follow the biochemistry in shift up and shift down experiments, look at the genetics, uh, and you can use these recombinant systems. And here this was done in with this. And you can see that high temperature, more proteins made, low temperature, there's relatively more replication of the, of the viral genome. Uh, you could use experimental animals and actually see where the virus is. There are ways of, of labeling and imaging viruses. And you could also run randomized controlled studies of chilling, but the important thing is to use wild respiratory viruses. And this was not done in the very early experiments in the 50s and 60s. They used lab strains, and we think this is why the whole field has got um, put off track. Going back to this point of the best temperatures for culturing fresh uh, samples in cells, there was a paper that has come out quite this year, uh, and it shows that indeed SARS-CoV-2 is easier to replicate or replicates to higher titers at 33 degrees compared to 37. Um, and then more recently, there's been one showing the same thing with experimental animals. So um, hamsters housed at low temperature tend to get more sick than hamsters at room temperature. Now, both of them interpret this as evidence that they, they, they focus on the idea that it could be the, um, the immune system is more active at higher temperatures. And we think this is true in many cases, but we don't think it's the main driver. There's many reasons why we think it's not the main driver of seasonality and pathogenicity. We think a lot of this is to do with RNA secondary structure because RNA secondary structure is intrinsically temperature sensitive. Um, and um, what have I put under there? May something. Or oh, maybe more important than um, protein sequence. Uh, so scientists tend to focus on protein sequences because they're very easy to study. RNA secondary structure is hard to study, but we all know that it's temperature sensitive and it has, in all organisms, it has a sort of regulatory function. Um, now, how would you treat, what are the implications for treating illness? And there are lots of potential um, uh, ways of, of, of um, preventing uh, or trying to um, minimize uh, the chance of, of, of COVID getting bad. But um, keeping warm could be very important. Just a heater in the bedroom, hot drinks, chilled food and exercise are maybe bad, but really you, we need to do experiments to, to control the experiments need to be done. Um, now I want to just go back to the trade-off model quickly and um, can you see the title? You probably can't. Um, anyway, um, the, we have the idea that the trade-off model, which is, and there are actually many trade-off models. This is the virulence transmission trade-off model. It tends to moderate pathogenicity. Now, the, the hypothesis was originally um, introduced to explain observations of myxomatosis in Australia, which is the kind of classic system for this type of thing. And there was a paper by someone called Fenner and Marshall in the 1950s. And what they found was if they introduced very virulent strains, which they call grade one, they were lab strains that they basically bred to be as pathogenic as possible. If they introduced these in the wild, within about a, or less than a year, 
the strains became moderate. They became grade three strains, as they called it. But what was very interesting is if they introduced grade four strains, which were the mildest strains, they also became moderate. They also became grade three. Now, with myxomatosis, it's spread by mosquitoes. And mosquitoes. really, it, it, the, the selection here is that the animal shouldn't die quickly. And the grade one um, strains were basically killing the animal too quickly. With the more moderate strains, the grade three ones, it would be ill for a long time, even if it wasn't moving around. In the case of um, insect-borne um, viruses, uh, that doesn't matter so much because as long as it's alive, mosquitoes can come to it. And I've written a summary. Um, I couldn't find a good definition in a paper, but uh, my interpretation of the, the trade-off model is that increased viral shedding, which comes from sort of greater viral activity, must be balanced against a reduction of the time during which shedding takes place. Uh, so in the case of the myxomatosis, they were dying too quickly. And also the reduced mobility of the host. Now, in the case of respiratory illnesses, this must be very important because we don't generally die. The, the selective pressure from death from COVID or anything else is not very great. But we don't move around so much when we're sick. And final balance between these, the equilibrium, if you like, will depend a lot on the environment. So you might think that the, the, the final degree of pathogenicity in a, um, a chicken barn, where all the animals are all together, and it's basically a race. If influenza gets into that chicken barn, it'll basically kill all the animals in a couple of days. But if you think of a, this is a wandering albatross, a virus is gonna to have to be much more slow acting if it's going to try and infect animals like wandering albatrosses, if they even have influenza, I don't know if they do. Um, so it's differences of mobility rather than mortality. And this is often misquoted. You hear scientists talking about uh, the trade-off model and they, they, they say, oh, well, it's all about death, but it isn't necessary. It's also about mobility. And I'm going to do a couple of thought experiments just to illustrate this point. So if you imagine a respiratory illness and it has a certain amount of activity, and I've drawn this line here, which if it goes above this line, you get a fever and you go to bed. Uh, now, if you can think of some other strains, so here's a much more aggressive strain. But here you go to bed when you cross the line and the actual opportunity for, for um, transmission is not very great. It's just the dark brown areas. And then here's a much milder strain, which takes longer to come, but it goes away quicker. I think it's pretty clear that B is the one that has the most opportunities for transmission. And then I had another thought experiment I wanted to do. So this is thinking about if you imagine an illness like Ebola, which is really, really aggressive at the beginning, what would have happened and what would have happened, you know, before um, modern medicine was able to try and isolate this and come up with vaccines and so on? Because these things must have been infecting us for years and years and other species as well. Um, what would have happened if it had escaped? So I started to do this here. You can imagine that it's spreading out and infecting other individuals but there's going to be some variation in the degree of, of activity, if you like, the degree of pathogenicity of the strain. And I've indicated this with the gray arrows and they go a bit further because animals and people, when they get sick, they tend to stop moving. It's true of cows in a field. If they get foot and mouth, they, they're very hard to move. Um, and um, so you can imagine that the virus spreads and then there are secondary cases. So the first thing that happens is these, the more virulent strains, which don't go so far, they uh, infect other individuals. Then a little later, the, the slightly milder ones on average, a little later may infect under the other individuals. So first the, 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 the red ones, the active ones spread and they spread out and maybe there are some less active strains and, and there would be more, even more aggressive strains. And then a little later, the less active strains spread out, and then they may mutate further, and there'll be a few strains that go even further than the original one, which I've indicated in blue. And you can imagine, now this is, I'm doing it very schematically, but you can imagine this 
it might take many, many more generations, but you might get this sort of pattern. And then there could be an area around here, because you have to remember these strains are competing against each other, because whichever infects uh, hosts first will cause antibodies. So the, the, the whole thing may get surrounded by, um, by uh, um, hosts who are already immune because they've, they've been infected by the blue variants and the red strains can't get out. And I would say it's got to be something like this because otherwise multicellular life forms would be impossible. <laughs> you know, there has to be some sort of um, uh, uh, trade-off model operating. And then the very last thing I wanted to show you was how this could have unexpected effects. And, and once you, you have to be aware of this trade-off model. So I, I took three premises. The first premise is different strains of, of uh, COVID-2 must vary in their typical incubation periods. And really that's got to be true, although we don't know how much the variation will be. This too is that the virulence of strains is correlated with their incubation periods, which is kind of intuitive. So a strain that's less active takes a long time to make you sick, um, and it doesn't make you as sick as the very aggressive strain, which um, has a lower incubation period and um, makes, you, makes you sicker as well. Um, premise three, thinking about track and trace. Now, strains with shorter incubation periods are actually more likely to get through track and trace. And in the UK, um, we had this track and trace system and it took roughly very often five or six days to contact individuals. So somebody would get sick, they'd have to they'd do a test and, and people would try and track down people who, were, who had been exposed in the few days before that. And, um, but if someone had, uh, if, if there was a very aggressive strain, it could go on to the next person before track and trace could catch up with it. But the slower strains that might take one or two weeks to uh, incubate might well be stopped by track and trace. And this could actually have a very dramatic or very powerful effect on the selection of strains. And that, oh, okay, just going back to the quotation and just a final comment. I mean, I find the whole thing very, very odd because I find it odd that people ever believed that being chilled wouldn't make you sick. I mean, it's called a cold. I find it odd that this has persisted for you know the last 60 years. And the thing I find most strange is that scientists don't seem to realize they have a problem, virologists, and, um, and they don't tend to, they're not on the lookout for a solution to this. Um, and because if they were, they'd, you know, latch onto our paper and the video and, and everything else. So that is the end of my talk. Thank you very much for listening. And um, I'd be very interested in any comments or questions that anybody might have. Thank you, Patrick. Um, yes, I don't know if anyone's got any um, questions. I'm going to ask one for, to start with. The, the where you talk about the um, increasing temperature in the nose and the throat. Um, what, what impact do you think mask wearing had? Well, that's a good question. Um, I mean, you might say, I can't see everybody, but here we go. Why doesn't it work? Oh, well. um, you might say that um, it would be protective because it's going to warm up the air slightly more, um, doing basically what your nose is already doing. Uh, on the other hand, I think the mystery about masks is why they don't work better, because common sense says they should work you know, they should work really, really well, and they don't seem to. Um, so I, I think the jury's out, really. Yeah, because there seems to be an awful lot, of, lot of evidence yeah. that actually, in some instances, could make things worse. Yes, so, uh, I've, I've managed to make myself be. Yes, I agree. And um, I, one hypothesis, you asked me if I have ideas. One hypothesis is that um, wearing a mask might encourage bacterial infections. And it yeah. is known that bacterial infections can can sort of um, trigger viral infections. So it might be something to do with that. OK, I've got a question from the chat here as well. It says, is there any evidence that sunshine, fresh, dry and warm air can help fighting respiratory illnesses in general? 
um, and specifically COVID-19, so typical for Mediterranean desert climate? Well, that's a really, that's a very good question. And um, I, may, I may share my screen in a second. Uh, I, I'm sure the answer is yes. And it seems to be very clear that vitamin D is protective against all sorts of things. It's protective against cancer uh, or sunshine is protective against cancer, but vitamin pills aren't. And yeah. it may be the same with COVID. Um, uh, it, it isn't the case. This is really my starting point that I'm saying. You do get respiratory illness in hot, sunny places. Uh, and it, they tend to be there all year round. So we think what happens is that the virus loses temperature sensitivity because it has to, to replicate that. And it reaches a new equilibrium. So if, if, if you were sick with a virus that you'd picked up in the tropics, if you, in temperate areas and you went to the tropics, you'd probably get better uh, because you're, you're just keeping warm. Um, so let me just show you, I would like to show you this. So if I share my screen again, um, uh, I'll just go down here. You can see it well enough, I think. Oh, God. Let's come back to the beginning. Um, this is the point about sunshine and vitamin D. So there it is. Every winter, every autumn, around this time of year, uh, yeah, one more, uh, there tends to be a spike, a surge in respiratory illness. And you can see it here um, in, uh, this was uh, Pfeiffer 2014, uh, which is here. But just after that, um, flu search trended in basically every country in the Northern Hemisphere. Uh, so this has been cut off. But you can see it here as well. These are these are um, British studies in the early autumn. A lot of people get this. In the data I showed you from uh, the Netherlands, in the very beginning of the study, there were very high levels of of um, and flu, and this makes sense because the temperatures just dip down. And um, so, can I drag that? Anyway, and early autumn is when vitamin D levels are at their highest. So the implication is it's not the main, this isn't the main driver of seasonality. Okay, I've got a um, few hands up. So Leo. I have some very quick questions to ask. Um, with the, the mechanism of, um, you suggested between the cooler region of the nose, I wondered why um, rabies would be uh, temperature dependent and how it would play out in reptiles. You mentioned that you were a zoologist. And then the other one that's a bit more complicated is in these warmer countries, particularly the tropics, you have a lot of air conditioning in the cities and very little in the more rural areas. And I wondered if you'd seen any data that might show a correlation, you know, between outbreaks in cities and not outbreaks in uh, presumably warmer rural areas. Uh, so what was the second question? Oh, reptiles. Uh, rabies is not a respiratory illness. And it tends to come in the summer, not in the winter. Uh, same with polio, which is not a respiratory illness. And it's generally true that all the other viruses uh, have variable seasonality. It's just this extraordinary thing that almost every single respiratory virus has this winter seasonality. Reptiles, uh, well, I don't know about <laughs> respiratory illness in reptiles, but they do get fevers and um, all, um, even amphibians, when they get sick, they tend to seek out warm places. Uh, it's, it's a very universal, the fever response, which is obviously relevant to this, uh, is really very universal. Um, uh, what was the last one? Last question. Uh, is there an effect potentially of air conditioning? Oh, air conditioning, yes. Uh, we tried to find data on this and Gosh, it's mentioned in our paper. I can't really remember what we found. I think I get sick sometimes. If you're in America and you go outside in, and you get in a shower of rain and then you go into a movie theatre or something, you can sit there shivering. I've had that and I did get ill after that. So I'm, I'm sure I, I believe that air conditioning can be quite unhealthy, but I'm not aware of any, any studies of this.
Okay, Christine. Hi there. Um, thank you so much for that um, talk. It was really interesting. But last week we were um, having a bit of a debate about um, why the rates of SARS-CoV-2 have been so much higher this summer than they were last summer. Um, and we were talking about the Delta variant and how it was more suited to warm weather because it came from India. I'm just wondering if that works then, if a variant evolves in a warmer climate and then it comes to a colder climate like here, how does that affect this mechanism? Uh, I completely agree. I think it is very significant. And I think when Delta first came from India, I think it's very likely that it was more aggressive because it had to adapt, it had less thermal sensitivity. Mm -hmm. um, and, but I wouldn't expect that to last for terribly mm -hmm. long. I'd expect it to last for two or three months. Okay, because we've had, like in Scotland, and it's pretty much the same in England, um, we've got, you know, 20 times as many people in the hospital ill with COVID on this date as we had last year on the same date. And also we've had a lot more deaths, you know, this time of year. And we were discussing whether the time of year really mattered. And we were having, we had quite an interesting debate about it, but I'm not sure now of what I think about that, having listened to what you said. Presumably we shouldn't be expecting then to see such a big difference at this time of year compared to the same time of year last year. Anticipating it's going to get worse in the next, in the next and few, how the next can few weeks. How can that happen then? Why? why because, be because there are a lot of people who've got it right now, um, but it's not very active. And uh, I th I'm, it, it's hard to say. It's all very complicated. The end of last summer, I think testing hadn't really got underway. And there were probably more people who might have been carrying dormant viruses. When the temperature dropped, they might have got sick and they might have spread it. And the virus has adapted itself to summer temperatures. And it's now more aggressive than it, than it needs to be for the autumn. But having said all that, it's, it's all complicated because we've got this testing regime and track and trace. And it's not the normal, you know, for this, for this trade-off mechanism to work, you've got to let some milder strains carry on and spread faster. And if you, if you run a very strict tr tr uh, tracing regime, you may pick those up and then make those people self-isolate. So, I mean, I sort of hesitate to <laughs> come up with, say, oh, we're doing everything wrong, but it's quite possible that, that the track and trace is actually not helping because it's, it's, too, it's working too well. And you have, to, you have to just let some strains spread a bit more. Yeah. Um, and that may well be why, why it's got worse. And then there are all these arguments about whether vac vaccination can, you know, how, how good can that be? On the whole, I think vaccination ought to be good because it means that the virus can't find a new host so quickly. So this would favor the slower, longer incubation strains. Um, but you could argue it the other way, which is to say the virus has to become more aggressive because everybody has got some immunity. Uh -huh. But um, what was I, I was going to make a comment. Scotland, we've had five waves now, just five, mm -hmm. I think five waves. Um, and this has been, this last one has been the highest positivity wave we've had. So it's not just about more testing, you know, the proportion of people who are being tested or coming back positive is higher in this wave than it has been in any of the previous waves. So it's clear, I mean, it's very clear that we're putting pressure on the virus, which is making it more transmissible mm. and more aggressive because it is causing disease in young people, especially mm. where it didn't before. Um, but like you say, it's a, it's a very, it is a complicated picture. Mm. Well, I mean, uh, uh, you know, my point is you have to take all these points into consideration. You know, you may be having quite an effect, 
by just by running a track and trace system uh, and with a certain timing, you know, you could be selecting either more aggressive or less aggressive strains. Okay, right. Thank you very much.